Hello, fabulous friends, fans, and superstars. Welcome to Synchronicity Web TV. I am your astrologer and your host, Nadia Shaw, and this is your moment of synchronicity. What an amazing uh, time that I am about to have. I know it, even just off camera, me and my guest, Jessica Leando, were just going on and on, and I kept saying, we got a lot of good things here. We got to turn on the camera. We got to turn on a camera. So I'm just so very excited to share with you a truly amazing person that I have seen over the last few years just shine so, so very brightly in the astrological world. And I remember way back when she was a baby astrologer and giving lots of love online to a lot of different astrologers out there. And you know, love is so attractive. And I have seen how many people in the astrology world um, have found um, you know, so much in her to shine, and she just continues to make us so, so very proud. So her really big achievement right now is the hugely popular ghost of a podcast. I know a lot of people who are into astrology love that podcast so much. And she has a new book coming out, so that's going to be really exciting, Astrology for Real Relationships that I can't wait to read. And of course, we're going to talk about 2020 and all kinds of amazing things. So Jessica, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for that really, really kind uh, intro. I loved every moment of it. I am so proud of you, honestly. And thank you so much for being here because really, I'm just getting back into interviewing people now. And you were like at the top of the list of people that I wanted to interview because I just think that you are doing wonderful things in astrology and you have such great energy. Thank you so much. That's so kind. I am so honored to be here. I was obsessed with your interview show back in the day. I can't remember when it was, but it must have been like at least maybe eight years ago. Yeah, it was. That's right. You know, it was such a while ago. Now that I think about it, it was 2008, 2009, 2010. A decade ago. Yeah, time really goes by, right? <laughs> Yeah, when was, you're an adult, it does. That's yeah, for sure. I think it was right around 2012 when I really like, you know, kind of hit a peak with it. And I interviewed so many astrologers that year. And then after that, it started to go in different directions. But that's how it is. That's the great thing about us doing what we do is that we mm -hmm. can just trust our creative inspiration. Yeah, I love having a career that can kind of uh, morph as you grow and change. And, you know, another thing we were just talking about is how much the astrology world, like the astrologers astrology world has really kind of expanded to meet so many of us uh, in, in a different way. So that's been really exciting too. So anyways, thank you for having me on the show. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. It's very interesting how uh, I've even noticed this going to conferences now for almost 15 years, the conferences get bigger and bigger and more and more new people coming in. And I think that, just like you said, right, there's the world of astrologers, mm -hmm. and then there's more like the masses, like people who like astrology, who consume astrology, or are fans of astrology. And that's grown a lot too. Shockingly, amazingly. And you know, what a lot of astrology fans don't know is that astrologers are fabulous nerds. We're just a bunch of nerds hanging out, talking arcane concepts, math. We're just like, <laughs> so you come true. to, I know, so you, it's amazing. You come to an astrology conference and it's like a nerd festival, which is like my happy place. It makes yes. me so happy, but it's really um, it's, it is really different than like astrology online, which is so cool. But, um, yeah, I love, I love our nerdy, I love our nerdy peers. Yeah. I describe it as putting my nerd hat on. So sometimes <laughs> when I'm making a video or teaching a class, I'm like, okay, I'm, now I'm going to put my nerd hat on and, and then I'll go off on something. Um, yeah. but it really, I mean, it's so all encompassing it, everybody, no matter what you're into, no matter what brings you to astrology or what, how your brain works you will find a place in the astrology world. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah, I absolutely yeah. think that's true. And it wasn't always true. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's like as with the kind of like internet becoming stronger, more uh, diverse peoples get to participate in things. And um, I think that's being reflected in the astrology world as much as it is everywhere else and in every other industry. So there's more diversity across the board because there was a time when I left the astrologers world because of the lack of diversity that I saw there. And I just kind of couldn't find my place. Um, but that's not the case anymore at all. So that's really wonderful. 
I really do believe that the more people who share, the stronger we are, the more that we all benefit together. And, you know, I also really believe that there is no competition, that ultimately we all rise together. And the competition really is just with yourself. And even that, I mean, I think we judge ourselves so much, but you do what you can. And if you did what you could, even if that's the very bare minimum, it's more than enough. Yeah. I agree with that completely. And I really am like, I am of the mind that if I speak to a journalist, you know, for a cool publication and they're asking me, you know, questions about whatever topic at the end of the call, almost always, if it feels appropriate, I'm like, are you talking to other other astrologers? Let me give you some names. Mm. Um, And I think that it's really when we, what is that expression? A rising tide lifts all ships. Like, you know, the more we we like share with each other, the bigger astrology gets. And also, like you said, there's no competition. There's just, there isn't. Yeah. A rising tide lifts so all ships. ships. Yeah. I didn't make that up. Somebody, it's like oh, yes. an expression. It's a quote. <laughs> yeah. I don't know who said it. Um, I don't want any credit for it, but it is true. And I, I just really like, I remember when we were at N- UAC um, in Chicago, was it in 2019 or 18? I can't remember. It was 2018. It was 18. last year. Yeah. I was talking to them. They were interviewing me. And at the end, I looked behind me and I saw you there and I was like, you have to talk to Nadia. And they did. And I was so happy. But it's like, I won't leave an interview without being like, talk to some, talk to someone and to really just share because there's the energy of generosity creates more abundance, not being a martyr, not, not being without strategy or career aspirations, but, you know, supporting colleagues. And I think that, that it's just, there's no downside to it. There just really is no downside to it. And with astrology, we're such weirdos. We might as well just do it our own way anyways. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is also that it's a very powerful thing to know that your truth is enough that whatever your unique voice is, as long as it's honest, I really believe this, as long as it's honest, people will resonate with it. And I think that it does take faith, you know, to be the kind of person who's going to be generous, who's going to give. It takes faith to know that, yes, there's astrology and it's everywhere and there's so much astrologers, but the unique way in which you are going to express your astrology, your interpretations, Mm -hmm. That is going to be all your own. And again, if it's honest, people will resonate with it. I mean, it's amazed me, actually. And it's always an inner job, right? It's always an inner thing. So Biggie is here now. We're back. Hi. We just took a second there. Uh, So I wanted to say, and Biggie will be here to to be testament, right? Biggie, you're going to hold testament here. (laughs) (laughs) But I remember I had a production deal with a company out in Toronto, a major production company and uh, a major network. And it was such a difficult experience because Mm. I wanted one thing. I wanted like a show that was for astrologers and and celebrated astrology and talked to astrologers. And somewhere along the way, they wanted to make it like a, like a South Asian youth lifestyle type of show. And they wanted me to like, you know, go to different events and things like that. And it was so like, not me, you know, it Mm -hmm. just became not me more and more. And, you know, I remember the moment I realized this isn't working, and I'm gonna have to let this go. And it was so painful. Like I was numb for like a month because it felt like, wow, here was this really big opportunity. And then, you know, it ended up not being the thing. And it's hard sometimes to remember to have faith. Sometimes you just have to tell yourself because you can't feel it for whatever Mm -hmm. reason. And I was kind of in that place, but I was just really sad. But it was after that that I realized YouTube let's do what I want to do on YouTube. And that led to all those interviews. And I ended up creating exactly what I wanted to do anyways, all along. Right. I mean, this is, this is, I think a huge part of the beauty of the forties and of the Uranus opposition, which we're both going through, which is you get to this place in your life where you can see that the things that seem like the greatest tragedies and the things that seem like the biggest losses were these gateways that you wouldn't have walked through on your own, but were the exact gateways you were supposed to walk through to get to where you needed to be. And I think that happens personally uh, in your mental health. I think that happens in opportunities. Like we get to this point where we're just like, I have to choose between 
the path that is certain, but I don't want Biggie is so cute and it hurts. <laughs> um, or we have to choose the thing that is actually authentic. And I am a huge believer, as are you, that when you choose authenticity, you don't go wrong. And that doesn't mean you get what you think you want. It doesn't mean that you get uh, you know immediate validation. Um, but I really do believe that. And in fact, I believe that so much that I, I, for my client load, booked up all of 2019 when I was in 2018, at the end of 2018. Um, and I decided that I wasn't going to schedule anyone for 2020, that I was going to open it up because I'm going through so many Uranus transits. And I was just going to see what came through. And I still don't know. It mm -hmm. is December, 2019. And I still don't know what's coming through for 2020. And I still want to do readings forever and all my life. But I really, I, I really believe in creating space and being present through the uncertainty and the not knowing. And, you know, I don't mean to say this and be like, and I feel chill about it. I don't feel chill. I'm a triple Capricorn. I never feel chill, mm -hmm. but um, I definitely believe in creating the space for the unexpected and the unplanned to come through. And when we do that, it's like, who could have predicted what YouTube would become, right? Yeah. Who could have predicted how YouTube would be this massive thing? And the fact that you came to it when you did allowed you to reach so many more people so much more organically and mm -hmm. come to a place that I'm ex experiencing now myself where I can be on a podcast or in, on social media or YouTube or whatever with more confidence now because I've been doing my thing kind of like in the shadows for years. And I think... Um, Honestly, I think it's harder for young people now because there's all this pressure to be like, I just learned what major arcana is in Tarot. I'm going to put out a video about it. Or like, yeah. I just learned what a transit is. I'm going to put out a series and sell it so that I can leave my corporate gig. And I don't blame people for doing that. But it is tricky because there's all this pressure to like uh, turn things into products right away, turn ideas into products. And we didn't have that 15 years ago in the same way. Oh, so let's talk about you. this tiny baby that you have on your lap. <laughs> I'm I sorry. just no, <laughs> never apologize. I, I, like I said, my partner was supposed to take him out so that we could just have our chill time. But you know, he he ended up by that whatever divine providence, he ended up being here. So that dog is so cute. <laughs> Can I ask you a thing. personal question about your dog, thing. though? Sure. Oh, Does he have a tooth <laughs> problem? No. Why? Not yet. Does Do his, you feel does, it? Does his breath smell? Not. Does his breath smell yeah. funny? Yeah, um, smells. But I, I get the feeling smell. that he has a little bit okay. of a like. It's right back here. Okay. Uh, it's in the back. I can't tell which side, but it feels like in the back, top of his mouth. Not all the way in the back, but like middle back, okay. top of his mouth. I feel like he has like a sensitivity up there. Okay. So it could be that he like ate something and like a sliver got up there, and okay. so I'm picking up on him right now. Or it might actually just be that you might want to like. Bring him to your little vet, Dennis. I will. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you yeah. for that. Yeah. He, he just he just showed it to me. He's oh, a very gosh. happy baby. Oh, thank you. Yeah. That makes Congrats. me so happy. Yeah. Oh, he's a really very does. happy baby. He just, just um he's a, he's he does have discomfort up there. So I, I feel like it's a, a sensitive place. Um, <laughs> Where are you going? He's a bilingual dog. Yeah. Okay, he oh, oh, he wants to lick your face. No, no, he doesn't lick my face ever. I think he's curious about the headphone because I'm oh, not. Normally I see, crazy. I see. Biggie, oh, he's, he's so cute. Get the asses, Biggie. Huh? Get the asses. There you go. Calm, baby. Calm. Sit, sit. I appreciate you being patient with this. Oh but my god. Speaking of, because we were talking about 2020. Sorry. Let's talk about 2020. I Let's. really want to talk to you about it because you were mentioning earlier, like I said, we just started talking. As soon as we came online, we were like, hey, oh my God, 2020 and this and that and that. And it was just so great. And I was like, look, I'm turning on this camera right now <laughs> because you're totally. brilliant. Um, but yes, 2020, a lot mm -hmm. of people are calling it the triple conjunction. Yeah, And I kind of think, okay, there are wide orbs there. They are kind of like, moving in a way where they're sharing energy. But when we look at the perfection of the yeah. aspects, it's a little bit different. So talk about that. What do you think about that? It, there's not a triple conjunction. Uh, that's what I think about that. I think okay. because for me with transits, I use a three degree orb. Um, and that's like a 10 degree orb, which mm -hmm. I, I can see why um, 
some astrologers might use a 10 degree orb for such important planets and such a rare event. Um, some astrologers might just want the drama and the, you know, <laughs> I think Saturn Pluto conjunctions dramatic enough in Capricorn. We don't need to throw Jupiter in the mix. Oh, yes. And honestly, Mercury and the sun are right there in that, um, conjunction. And on a personal note, my birthday is January 11th. So it's practically oh, on my birthday. So the um, whole year for you is going to be huge. It's yeah. a great thing. Look at, see, this is the great thing about being an astrologer. You knew <laughs> that. Yeah. And so you were like, okay, I know myself and I know my astrology enough to be like, okay, I'm not going to plan anything. I'm not going to have clients or nothing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Saturn and when Saturn and Pluto meet, but in particular, this is like a message of Pluto in general, but really when Saturn and Pluto meet, you have to be willing to let go of everything. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to let go of security and stability and fear. And we must do this or Pluto shoves its little hand up our throats and is like, I'll just take what I need. Your heart, your guts, whatever. Oh, and so wow. I just went into, I mean, you can tell I'm super I love, super I love the way you say that. I like to say smacks you on the butt. That's I mean, I yours is kinder. Yours it. is kinder. Yeah, uh, I've been going through some Pluto transits for some time. So I'm going with the down the throat. It is actually the more tame way of putting it that I also think works for Pluto. But um, I, think, I think that um, the, the thing that Pluto demands is that we're willing to let go. And the thing that Saturn demands with Pluto is that we look at, oh God, that's cute. The darker <laughs> side of, of our kind of belief system and our inherited structures. And mm -hmm. so I'm really, um, I don't think Jupiter is involved in this conjunction. And I, I think Jupiter is uh, too far away. Mm -hmm. I do think I give the sun a conjunction, even though it's like maybe almost a degree off, um, but I could see including that, but I'm not really seeing uh, the, the three planets. And I think it's a little misleading when astrologers say that, even though maybe just astrologers use it, it's like in the same sign. But it's not rare in the same way when it's just in the same sign. So, And so what do you make of the fact that, because to me, it's very interesting that we have this uh, conjunction of Saturn and Pluto. And the way that I see it is this started the Protestant Reformation, right? Mm -hmm. the, that last mm -hmm. time this happened. And if you think 1518, about- 1518, correct? Yeah. So you think about, um, I believe that's the year, but that was literally uh, symbolically what kicked off the Protestant Reformation. And if you think about that, Yes, there were things that were really challenging that happened in societies as a result of that shift of power. But at the same time, it really represents this whole different understanding of ourselves as human, mm -hmm. where we're like, you know what, my interpretation of the Bible is enough. It puts the, the person, the individual, as mm -hmm. the nucleus of society as opposed yeah. to, you know, having a hierarchy. And I think that that is a, a huge shift in our understanding of ourselves. So how do you think, because I also find it really interesting that immediately following this conjunction, we're going to have Pluto meeting um, Jupiter again and again, yeah. or rather I should put it the other way, Jupiter will meet Pluto again yeah. and again, because yes. it's yes. Jupiter who's zipping around. Mm -hmm. And so how do you interpret that, that sense of right afterwards. And we're having that throughout the year of 2020. Yeah. So with Jupiter, so the first thing I should say is that I have a more dim version or view on things. Um, I'm definitely a lot less of an optimist. Um, I can't would help it. To... I'm a Sag moon. What I, can I you say? Know what? Yeah. Sun, moon, and rising in Capricorn. No one ever accused me of being optimistic. So um, that said, uh, you know, when I look at Jupiter-Pluto conjunctions, it really, for me, um, kind of brings up the fires we see raging globally. And when I say fires, I mean literally there's fires raging as we speak um, in many places in the world. And also, I'm speaking metaphorically of the fires raging in protests around the world. People are coming together and standing up against oppressive regimes, um, demanding more as you're referring to it, like individual power over their own lives, self, uh, self-governance, I guess what it is. Um, and I think that with Jupiter, Pluto meeting in Capricorn, um, when we see that, especially in concert with Saturn in Aquarius and Uranus in Taurus and Neptune in Pisces, what we see is either we as a people are going to come together both domestically and globally 
And we are going to demand not just rights for ourselves, but rights for our cousins and our neighbors and our frenemies and our enemies, rights for everyone, rights, real equality, or we're going to see a power grab. We're going to see corporations and governments um, kind of developing more uh, like kind of a stricter arm and more power. And I think that the, the Jupiter Pluto specifically um, can be a time where we have major drama um, in a way that is creative and transformative or destructive and limiting. And I think a lot of that has to do with how people respond to fear because we're still talking about Capricorn Mm -hmm. and Capricorn, you know, people love to talk about how it's, um, all about business or whatever. But the reason why it's all about those things is because it is essentially material and Mm fear-based. So I need more power, more proof, more evidence. And so when we put that paired with spiritual issues and with social issues, um, that can turn really negative quickly or it can turn really positive quickly. And I just keep on looking at Hong Kong and what the people are doing there for the last, what is it, six months? And it's so inspiring and art is a huge part of protest there. And I think that um, Jupiter in Capricorn can really be about like functional art um, and the transformation that comes from creating something material. Um, So I don't know, that's kind of a long answer and uh, I'm not sure if it fully answered your question, but that's my take. The thing is, at least with Hong Kong, we know about it. The same thing is happening in other parts of the world, but it's just like you said, they're, they have these like media bans in so many places. I'm thinking about parts of Ukraine. I'm thinking mm-hmm. about uh, Kashmir and South mm-hmm. Asia. These yes. are all spaces where the same thing is happening. Like you're seeing yeah. in Hong Kong where there's this uh, desire and this expression for, for freedom and for self and for self-determination. But in some places, it's like they have this media blackout, this internet blackout, like in Kashmir in particular, and it's really sad. Like it's, that to it's me, it's scary. Is, that's it's the scary. scariest thing yeah. because it is silencing a people. Yeah. And I understand, like people have differing views about everything, and you know, I am like the person who least wants to be controversial about anything. So I'm not saying anything about right or wrong or judgments or anything like that. But what I am saying is. When you silence people, it is, on the one hand, an expression of fear of the silencer. That is a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. But the other part of it is it's it's such an essential part of what it means to be a human being is to be able to express, Mm -hmm. you know, just to be able to express. And that that to me is 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 very painful to me to think that there are people in the world living that way. It makes me incredibly yeah. sad. The silencing is what makes me sad more than anything. It is really, it is really terrifying. And, and, you know, it's important to acknowledge, you know, the last time Uranus transited through the sign of Taurus, we had war, we had a global war. And I'm not saying that that means we'll have it now. <laughs> you know, that's, I don't think one equals the other, right. but I, I do think what is important is you know, with world war two, you know, there were concentration camps and we're seeing concentration clam- camps globally Mm -hmm. in different countries. And we are seeing kind of, it's not just about what, what governments are doing to oppress people, although that's bad enough. What we're also seeing is the secrecy. And so when we don't have access to self-expression, as you're saying, then we have compromised self-determination. And that is something that should concern us all. And I know that for some people that is controversial. I don't think it should be though. Um, I really believe that I want my the people who disagree with me on a fundamental level to have the same basic rights that I have. And I want them to want the same for me because it's kind of, you know, it's it got to kind of be all for one, one for all. And we don't have to agree. Not all things have to be equal for each individual, but we all just determine, we all deserve to self-determine. And we all deserve to have freedom and to live free of cages and oppression and all that kind of s- terrible stuff. Um, I think, and I do you know, want to just mention quickly, yeah, it is worth noting that more of the world is more peaceful than ever before. Mm. More of the world is more prosperous than ever before. Less people live in poverty than ever before. So I do feel as a whole, we're moving mm. in the right direction. That gives me so much hope. My Sag moon needs that, right? Yes. And so that gives me so much hope that we are moving in the right direction. But I think that it is because of that when we do see pain, we feel it more. 
because it isn't like a malaise of pain everywhere, but rather it is that there are these uh, places in the world where it feels especially pronounced. And so we notice it, we identify with it so much more. Ultimately, you know, we're seeing ourselves in all of this, regardless of where you fall on whatever. Yeah. It is and about, also, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I was saying like, it's about what you believe about your right to express that speaks to how okay you are with other people's right to express. And I'm not saying that that means all the world's cameras should show up and give somebody a microphone. I'm not saying that, but just now today, expression, the digital world is such a huge part of it. It's not enough to just stand in a park and say what you want. But there is that factor that an extension of ourselves is our online persona and what we share online. And it is taking that away, you know, Mm -hmm. however anonymous, however in whatever corner you may be, to completely remove that from a person is what, you know, is concerning. And I don't know, I just feel like, you know, I have my feelings about what it is, but at the same time, I feel like it is productive for us to think about how it is that we can um, ensure that we are a part of what I like to call love and wisdom. Again, I know I'm a Sajman, I'm an optimist, but I think it becomes that much more important to put love and wisdom in the world, that much more important to be authentically and unapologetically ourselves and to use our voice to express ourselves, to have a YouTube channel. Just having a YouTube channel, there are so many people who can't have that. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. it, it makes it that much more, whatever your truth may be, to share it, if only for you, because it's more than enough, it's for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I will say, as a triple Capricorn, if she doesn't have an optimistic bone in her body, um, <laughs> I don't I believe don't. that, though. I know but, people say that, but really, what, I'm not optimistic. So, what is it in your do you have any fire in your chart? You know what? The or only air? fire I have in my chart is in the 12th house. Okay. Um, so barely. So um, in a past life, you were very. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of air in my chart. I have a fair amount of okay. air in my chart, but okay. I definitely, I, I am not optimistic, but I'm very determined. I am mm-hmm. very proactive towards what I believe to be um, the best possible actions, intentions, resolutions, whatever. And I, you know, I think, I think that the more that we are willing to engage with all of this stuff, this uncomfortable content, and notice our knee-jerk reactions to liberalism or conservatism, um, and really be interested in, well, why is that my knee-jerk reaction? And is it because I strongly disagree? Or is it because I'm scared? I'm scared Mm -hmm. of being implicated in this because Mm -hmm. nobody wants to feel like they're a bad person. And all of us struggle. And when one side says to the other side, your struggles aren't as valid as my struggles, it makes that side defensive. And I think that what happens with kind of the the decimation of information that we have, this is new. You know, we are living through the first time in human history where everyone has the news in their pocket in a computer phone, right? I know that's Mm -hmm. not what they're called. They're not called computer phones, but that's what they are. And really the truth is, is that we've never had such a data overload as we have now. And related to that, let's be realistic, bad news sells, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, whether we're talking about astrology or we're talking about like global events, bad news sells, bad news is click worthy. And so we have all of these scary bits of news out there And I'm not saying that that's disproportionate to what's true or not. I actually don't feel like I know that, but I can say that it is important to like make sure that we're acknowledging that the human heart isn't actually wired for this constant onslaught of bad news. It, it, it paralyzes us and that we must treat all things, uh, with kind of the consideration of what is sustainable for our nature. And to never kind of forego self-care for being informed, but not to forego being informed and call it self-care. So it's about what is the balance and what is your nature. For someone like me, I have to take great pains to have optimism or to be positive. Um, And, you know, for other people, they have to do the opposite thing. And I think that it's really about knowing yourself and being a part of the world in a way that is positive. Now, that all said, I'll just say one more quickie thing for the Jupiter-Pluto which is the climate crisis. Mm. I think that we're going to see uh, kind of a, a quickening of um, consequences. Mm. 
And in response to that, whatever it is that the governments and corporations that have the most power do or don't do, I think we'll see, um, we'll see people respond, like the people respond um, in different countries in different ways. Um, and I think this will happen, my, my sense is that this will happen in rashes, like, or in waves rather. Rashes is probably the wrong word for Jupiter, Pluto, it's two on the money. So we'll call it in waves, we'll call it in waves. Um, but yeah, I have some so, other things I'm thinking of. When you yeah, I know. That. Yeah, yeah. Let's Terrible. not. Jupiter, yeah. Pluto's no good. Yeah. It's no good. Yeah. So anyway, so that's, it's, it's a lot. And you know, and I'm glad we're talking about this and I'm glad we actually come from a different place around it because I think, I think that, you know, there's a, there's, it's hard to be positive for me about the astrology of 2020. Um, because I do see the Saturn and Pluto are big themes, you know, and they're not chill when Saturn and Pluto meet in the sky. Um, it tends to, to evoke some of the worst of our natures and that's not the only thing that it does, but it does that. Um, and so it evokes our fear, right? Our own sense of restriction and, you know, our shadow, essentially. It it's the it, shadow yes. that we end up projecting. And with Saturn, it's so much about our conditioning and our tradition. And yeah. all of that gets wrapped up into one. Like, my family always believed this about these people are there. And mm -hmm. therefore, I'm going to continue that cycle of projection. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's intense. It, yeah. It's intense. And I think, you know, when we talk about the systems, you know, I think it was in uh, Saturn, Pluto, in Libra, that uh, the United States incorporated uh, prisons, mm -hmm. which is, you know, an extension of slavery. And I'm sorry if that's too political. You can feel free to edit me. I'm fine with that. But um, I, I, I think that there is a way that those inherited things, when they get applied to systemic issues and and kind of like uh, indoctrinated into um, religion or into politics we can see some pretty rough stuff happen now again not to be negative nancy saturn and pluto gives us all the tools we need to overcome our problems it doesn't just give us problems it gives us tools but the tools are usually a spoon and a concrete wall <laughs> but it gives you time, you know? So I think that there's, oh, if we have a willingness to kind of like get into it and really do the labor, um, I think we can have the best possible outcomes. I, I don't mean to suggest that we can't. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's tricky, you know? It's, it can be heavy. It can be heavy. I do think that there's that balance, right, between action and doing, but there's also, I feel that there's a lot of power in being still, mm -hmm. you know? And what I mean by that is still within yourself. You can still take action. Like, for example, it is an action to put love and wisdom in the world. Again, yes. I know, Saj Moon, but it is an action to choose to give and to be kind and to be loving. And also it is an action to choose not to engage people who are toxic or who are putting out mm -hmm. an energy, who are wanting, whether it's personally or whether it's on a larger scale. Yeah. It, it, it sometimes takes a tremendous amount of dedication to choose that you are not going to react, but rather you're going to consciously act in a particular direction. Mm -hmm. But I think we are so much more effective and so much more powerful when it comes from a stillness, a connection to a stillness yes. within us. Yes. And I think that is part of the personal lesson for a lot of people. And you know, like I am doing a cruise event on, at the exact conjunction, right? So I- You're gonna be on a boat? I'm gonna be on a big boat, yes. A big wow. boat, yeah. So basically the first night is when the conjunction is exact on the 12th of January. And I'm literally taking a telescope on and there's going to be 60 other, 70 other like-minded people. And we are going to look up at the sky. We're going to look wow. at the conjunction. We're going to meditate under the sky. And there were some astrologers who were like, wow, you're going to be on a boat for the conjunction? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, like, let's be out there. Yeah. Let's yeah. go in it. Like the Capricorn's a seagull. Capricorn's a seagull. Yeah, who yeah. are we kidding here, people? Like, be on the ocean. Yes. Yeah. Like, get away from the earth. And yes, it's mm -hmm. Capricorn. Yes, it's earthly energy. But there's just so much and it's so concentrated. So let's get some water going. Let's be in the mm -hmm. middle of all that emotion. And let's be still. Mm -hmm. You know, let's be under the sky. Let's meditate under this conjunction. Let's 
look at it and feel it and decide on our reaction. Mm -hmm. And that to me is, is possibly the thing that's going to save us. It yeah, is I, the thing that's going to save us. I'm, I'm, in, I'm inclined to agree. And I think, I think that where people misunderstand Capricorn energies is again, they think business and conservative, but you know, Greta Thunberg, that young, that, that young child who's like a actual conservationist, she's like a double or a triple Capricorn as well. She, she's a great example of Capricorn energies are about conservation and we cannot have conservation without having a deep abiding respect and stillness. It's not possible. And, you know, when I think of an archetype, of Saturn or Capricorn energies, I always come up with these two archetypes. One is Darth Vader because he's got daddy issues and he's all shut down. He's wearing like a metal outfit. He's monotone um, and monochromatic. But also there's Mary Poppins. She like comes in with her little magic umbrella. She shields you from your daddy issues. She helps you understand capitalism in a better way. Magic, magic, magic. And then she goes away. Capricorn and Saturn are magical signs. I think in their kind of highest elevated uh, embodiment. And that that particular magic isn't Neptunian, like just fantasy, which has its place. What it is, is what you're talking about, which is going into the stillness, going into um, the parts that aren't especially easy or quick to be with and bringing awareness and presence because wisdom takes time. And having spiritual wisdom and not applying it in your daily life, it isn't really wisdom. It's ideas, it's philosophies. And again, those are great things. But when we're talking about all this like Capricorn 2020 business, especially January, we want to be able to accumulate and embody wisdom, which means being in the stillness, being in the discomfort, being in the fear and responding with intention and acting with intention. And I think, um, I think that what that looks like for different people and different cultures and different, you know, whatever issues is very different, but it's all ultimately quite simple. And, you know, the semantics of how you'll frame it and I'll frame it are, are different, but it's the same thing. And, and I think that, um, I know I find it very exciting and I'm really, you know, for me, people are always asking me like, well, why is astrology having its moment now? I'm, I mean, there's a lot of answers for that. We need it. That's why. But I, ultimately, I that's, that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's we it. We need it. Is that we, it's about reanimating the sky. And, you know, as my former professor, Patrick Curry, he actually has written a lot about this idea of enchantment mm. and this idea of how um, he's actually made this connection between Max Weber, who was like sort of the godfather of sociology and, and also astrology today. So basically, Max Weber talked about what he called the iron cage of postmodernism mm -hmm. and this idea that we live so close together in these cities, but we are more isolated and alienated than ever. Yeah. And so Patrick Curry says that what astrology does is it reconnects us, like mm -hmm. right at the source and right to the sky. It makes us less alone. Mm -hmm. And I think that it also represents our connection, our connection to everyone and everything. It's yeah. not just about the fact that my life is connected to the stars, whether it's, you know, on a very unconscious, very deep level, but it's also this idea that if I'm connected to the stars, then we all are connected to the stars yep. and yes. in that we're together. Yeah. And so I think it brings people out of that sense of isolation and that, that very painful alienation. Mm -hmm that it is yeah. to live in the modern world. And it's more so now than ever before mm -hmm. with how plugged in we are. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. And you know, I, as you were talking, I, I was remembering just last night, I was talking to my mom about this because she said to me, Hey, is Madonna still making music? Does she still do what she does? And I was like, Oh yes, <laughs> she is full on. She is going, she's making music. She's putting out, uh, lots of tours and things like that. So she is full on doing her thing. But the thing is now, because we have that computer and phone in our pocket, as you said, mm -hmm. we are more focused on what we're into, right? Like mm -hmm. even the news is curated for us. Our yeah. Facebook feeds, our Apple feeds are curated towards what it is we've already seen. And so what happens is whatever you're into, you get more of that. Yeah. So people who are really into astrology, 
they know the astrologers. They start to learn more and more mm -hmm. about the different astrologers. And that becomes kind of like your world, if you will, right? Yeah. But the people who are not necessarily thinking about astrology, they don't know like what's going on. They're thinking about whatever, whatever they're into, right? Football, mm -hmm. let's say, for example. I would not know who's a football <laughs> player and who isn't, right? Not at all. I, not at all. I was in Vegas though once and I remember I was walking around. There's like these shops at Caesars Palace, all the designer shops. And I was walking around there in and out of the stores and there was this entourage and there was one person in the middle of the entourage. And I was like, that's a football player. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's a football player. And they? Just, well, there was the one guy who was a football player and then he was surrounded by his friends. I didn't ask him. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. But the energy was there. The energy right, was there. Right. But I couldn't name him or anything like that. Um, he was sort of like the sun in a solar system and all these planets around him and stuff. Good for him, you know? And, you know, another thing you said that I really resonated with was, you know, you said how we all want to feel like we are good. Maybe you didn't use those exact words. Yeah, no, I think I did those actually. Lines? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. awesome. Yeah. So I was thinking about how it, you know, it was Freud who said that on a very uh, structural level of our psyche, our parents are the living embodiment of God. And mm. whatever it is that our relationship with our parents is, that determines and speaks to what we come to understand is the nature of God. So if you have a, a parent who is very wrathful, that's what you come to know on a very you know deep, seed level of the psyche hmm. you come to have that sense that that's what higher power is that's what god is and so uh, he actually talks about this in this idea uh in this essay that i love that changed my life called on on melancholy on melancholia hmm. that's what it's called and in this essay he says that it is that big a deal to be able to acknowledge that you are angry at your parents or you're angry at your childhood or, you know, you were hurt in your childhood. It is as if you are challenging God. Hmm. And there are times certainly when the psyche is not ready to do that. The psyche hmm. cannot do that, cannot acknowledge that. And so what happens is it creates a, a type of anger that becomes misdirected. Mm. And so one of the ways he argues in this essay is that that is at the root of depression, that ultimately that energy of anger turns inward and people start to become depressed and they start to, you know, be very hard on themselves because the psyche isn't ready to acknowledge what the true anger is. But once you do that, once you move past that, that's where real healing and independence can be found mm. and what Jung called individuation. That's us putting our nerd hat on right now. For those totally, who are yes. Yeah. And so I was thinking about, as you were talking, that this idea of Saturn and Pluto, it is going to go for each person in their individual journey because I'm very interested in the individual. I think that's where the power is. Mm it's going to go one of two ways. Either the psyche is going to be like, no, I'm not even ready to challenge that. I'm going to continue the pattern. Or the psyche is going to go, wow, like that really sucked. And I'm ready to acknowledge what has hurt me. I'm ready to acknowledge my trauma mm -hmm. so that I can move past it and then find myself. Yeah. That's the thing. Then you find yourself on the other side, but there's a reason that Scott and Peck called it the road less traveled because mm -hmm. it is hard. Mm -hmm. It is a hard, is hard thing to do on so it many is. levels. Yeah. The, yeah. To acknowledge whatever has hurt you and to really on a level of psyche to look in the face of what you understand is the nature of God and say that was not okay. That's mm -hmm. a huge thing for people to do. Even if they don't conceptualize it that way, even if intellectually they don't understand that energetically, subconsciously, that's what's happening. And I think that is going to be a turning point, a decision point for a lot of people with this conjunction of Saturn and Pluto, especially people who have this conjunction activating their chart in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you said like, that's mighty close to your son. You said, oh, right? I, oh, it's, it's conjunct my son. Yeah. Wow. Within, within a degree. Yeah. 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 So, and also my ascendant within yeah. like two degrees or something. So it's hitting my chart really directly, but I also, 
you know, I think that kind of to like add, add to this, like shifting to talking about it on a more personal, whenever we're dealing with Saturn Pluto intensity, I think what we're called to do is confront loneliness, whether it's real loneliness, like loneliness in that you're actually isolated, or if it's the psychological, spiritual, or emotional condition of loneliness and to be, to, to be in it. And the problem with that is we all have a tunnel of our own trauma, loneliness, whatever. And what most of us do is we get, we, we were like, okay, I'm going to do this work, whether we are forced to, or we choose to, we're like, I'm going to do this work. I'm going to do this work. And we go and it's dark and it's, we don't know what's going to happen on the other side. It's taking forever and you feel lonely and awful. And we get halfway through. And then what happens is we're like, I'm only halfway through. I don't know what's on the other side. It's going to take me so long to get there. F this. I'm not doing it. So what we do is then we turn back and we came back the way we came from. We don't make real change. And we feel like, but I've been working for so long. I've been trying so hard, but we do it because the fear of the unknown is so much greater than what we kind of really acknowledge. And so my thing that I'm always telling clients is, you know, when you're halfway through the tunnel is when it's the worst. It's when you're at the peak of loneliness and when you're furthest from assurances, it's when you're furthest from any sense of proof or evidence. And so being able to say, I'm going to stay in this and it's back to faith, which is something we were talking about earlier. And I'm going to keep on doing this work, even though there's no cookie I can see no cookies. No, nobody's offering me treats. No one's patting me on the head. No one's, everyone says I'm nuts. No one says I'm doing a good job. And you stay with the work. Then you get to someplace else. And, you know, when we're dealing with something like what you're talking about, like recovering from a difficult childhood, you know, it, even parents who treated you terribly, who let's say you don't talk to anymore, giving yourself permission to have your own feelings, giving yourself permission to say, you know, I'm going to forgive these people. And that doesn't mean I'm going to invite them into my life even if it's something like that, it still is terrifying and it engages something so core. And as you're saying, I really do think that these transits are going to bring the, this to individuals on a level that we really don't see frequently as astrologers, thank God, because it's not easy. Mm. But the potential here is to have deep, penetrating and sustainable growth deep, penetrating, and sustainable healing. And that is the joy of all of this, is that if there's something you want to change, if there's something that needs healing, you know, you might as well rip off the whole Band-Aid right now because it's going to hurt one way or another. So step into um, your willingness to really kind of get to the other side is the key. I think it really is. And, and that inevitably engages loneliness when Saturn's involved. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, it takes bravery and it takes doing kind of what you're speaking to, which is reaching out to people. And that is a, a, a hard and scary thing increasingly for people, especially younger generations where everyone, you know, in school always had a phone. Everyone has their own computers. Like people aren't talking in the same way they used to. So like, it's a lot. And being in the same space with people as they used to as well. Yes. And it's weird because we are more connected than we've ever been before, but we're also more isolated than we've yes. ever been before. You, and that oh, was sorry. part of the dichotomy of the age of Aquarius, you know? Yes. Yeah. I remember in 1995, I moved to San Francisco just the year before and I had a Walkman. And if you don't know what a Walkman is, uh, Google it. They're very cute. It was, it was a great Walkman. I was listening to it, audio cassette. And I got onto a bus and the bus driver was like, oh, you have an antisocial box. And I was like, he's wow. right. I yeah. am being antisocial by having this Walkman and I never used one again. Wow. And in fact, I wasn't on headphones again on, in public transit mm -hmm. until like phones and the whole world changed this way. Yeah. But it always stayed with me because I was just like, you know, I had a great chat with that bus driver. He was awesome. And mm -hmm. I remember him 25 years later. Um, and there are bus you know, drivers I remember too. Right? They really were there or they say they they saved me for that day or they gave me like emotional support and they didn't even know it or just that they made me smile or they made me think. Yes. Bus drivers, you know, they're doing sacred work if they yes. choose to approach it that way or even whether they're aware of it or not, they have the opportunity to do very mm -hmm. sacred work with what yeah. they do. Yeah. Yeah. And anyone who's shepherding humans and like showing yeah. up for our mundane lives. And I think now you see that no one's looking at each other. No one's chatting. I used to 
connect with people in public transit all the time. Mm. I used to like talk to strangers. I mean, maybe not strange men, but you know, in general strangers. And I, I really loved it. And I, I, I really loved connecting with people and making eye contact and smiling. And it happens so much less now. Mm. Um, it's a sadness, but then again, you know, this is where I can hear my age where I'm like, Mark and mm-hmm. <laughs> you know I mean? but I think but, it's protection, you know, yeah. people for yeah. what, are, because there's just so much mm-hmm. that's always there's coming so at you. There's so much. And I think it is one way that we kind of put a shield around us. And there's this balance that I think ultimately ends up allowing us to live and to love more fully, but also to find a sense of keeping ourselves safe protecting our own sensitivity so that ultimately it can be used to our advantage or Mm -hmm. to the advantage of others as well. You know, interestingly, as you were speaking, I was remembering a client of mine who said that the type of work that that doctors have to do, the thing is that the people who would be really good at doing it, they're the ones who who resist it, or at least they burn out, right? They're the ones who end up truly hurting themselves by doing, by taking on that work. And it's those types of people that we need to be practicing yeah. healing, to be practicing medicine. But it's those very types of people that, you know, in order to take care of themselves, they might not even get into it, or they might mm-hmm. decide that, okay, they start on the path, but then they go, I'm going to do something a little bit different. And so, and I know how many people have, you know, there's this this stereotype out there of the detachment, right? Mm-hmm. That detachment and how it annoys people when they go to a doctor and the doctor is so detached. But then you think about our lives, right? And how hard it is to be engaged. And I think there's a healthy way to find balance. Mm-hmm. There's a way to be able to engage, be able to give, but then also make sure that you're doing what you need to give to yourself so that you are replenished. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So. Jupiter and Capricorn, some very quick insights on your part, Jupiter and Capricorn. Um, I mean, in the context of the world, I think there is, on the downside, the risk of religion becoming more part of governments. Um, And I love the separation between church and state, personally. Uh, And so I think that's the downside risk. I think the positive risk is that not the positive risk, the positive potential Mm -hmm. is that um, we have the potential to create a world in which there's greater humanism in the structures that govern us, whether we're talking about institutionalized religion or we're talking about uh, corporations or the government. We have the potential for um, kind of writing humanism into the legislation, right? That's the positive potential. Now, in the context of all these things, you know, what I always say about Jupiter, and not all astrologers agree, but what I always say about Jupiter is, Jupiter is not a a lucky planet. It's not a positive planet. That's one truth, but the real truth is that it's the expander. So if you have a zit, it makes your zit big, (laughs) you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, Jupiter governs cysts and, and, you know, boils and stuff like that. It's growth. And so, when we look to Jupiter, we look at it expanding what is. And so wherever Jupiter is hitting your chart, there will be an expansion. Make sure it's an expansion of what you want. Make sure you're conscious and aware of what is happening in that part of your life so that that expansion feels like an improvement. And I tend to find that Jupiter tests how well you know yourself, similar to Saturn, but with a very different vibe. Um, and the way that it tests it is it gives you an opportunity. And if that opportunity is a separate slice of a second slice of cake, yay, a second slice of cake. But what if you know every time you have two slices of cake, you feel terrible afterwards. You have to know yourself to know what is a delight and what is an excess. And Jupiter teaches us that generally by giving us the opportunity to have excess. So that's on a personal level where I really see things happening because Capricorn is earthbound and it is about our material relationship to the material world, right? Um, So that's my hot take. How about you, girl? Well, I, you know, I, I love that we as astrologers can bring ourselves to the archetypes and, and yes. understand them with greater richness and things like that. I think Biggie dropped his little chew thing. He's no, not the chew dropper. Here you go, baby. You want so that? Cute. There you go. Maybe he's making some noise. 
back here. He's down there. See, let me there see. He oh, he's cute. No, but I can't yeah. hear him. Oh my God. Okay. He's cute. Look at those little socks oh, he's wearing. His socks. I'm all about the socks, right? I could tell, you know, I'll tell you something very honestly. I have a, a, a video that I have to make about Jupiter and Capricorn as we're recording this. Mm -hmm. And the thing is Jupiter and Capricorn, normally I record the video even before the planet changes signs. As a planet yeah. changes signs, I make like a special for YouTube. I've been doing this throughout the history of my channel for like 11 years. And the other thing is that I've already done like the horoscopes for the individual signs for Jupiter moving through into the sign of Capricorn and what that means, you know, based on the house that it's going to move into and things like that. But I have felt resistance to mm. recording this video. First, I got sick. So the first week, I couldn't even like my throat was not even allowing me to actually mm -hmm. speak. And it kind of happens this time of year, every year. And I think it's because the sun moves into my sixth house. The sun moves into my sixth house right in December. And every December, I have like throat things that happen. Interesting. And you wouldn't think that, right, with the sixth house. But I think it has to do with the connection to self-care. I think that's mm -hmm. the root of it. Yeah. yeah. It's but trying it, to get you in your body year. whatever way it can. Exactly. And yeah. this is such a big part, having yeah. a grand trine in air. It is, you know, my throat, my voice. Uh, my expression is such a huge part of mm -hmm. how I know who I am, you know, interestingly, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. And we all have our own ways of knowing ourselves. And this is such a big way of how I know myself. So it's very interesting to me to observe that. But I have felt resistance to making this video. And Where I Where do you have Capricorn like in your chart? I have Capricorn actually in my, it's my descendant. Mm. And it's my sixth house and seventh house. And I have Venus in Capricorn, actually. Jupiter I just love went Venus over and Venus. Capricorn. I love it too, right? Yeah. I just had Jupiter move over my Venus and it just, I mean, I can't tell you how incredibly happy I have been. I've had these one, it's a sixth house Venus. So these wonderful work-related breakthroughs have mm. happened. And it's just, I, I mean, my clients have come through for me, my, my book. Uh, is doing so well. So all of these things, like it just filled my heart and allowed me to feel, but a lot of that might be the Uranus opposition that I'm happening right now too, right? Well, so, I, they can't hurt each other yeah, at the yeah. same time. Right, right. Yeah. They, yeah, they work well together. But yes, I have felt resistance. So some of the thoughts, I, and I loved what you shared as well, but some of the thoughts I have, particularly around Pluto meeting Jupiter in the sky, and this idea around choice. You know, mm -hmm. are we going to elevate or are we going to expand and, and come down, right? Because mm -hmm. ultimately Pluto in its higher vibration, it is transformative, mm -hmm. but in its lower vibration, uh, it is cruel, really. Yes. And, you know, I'm also reminded of Stephen Forrest. I remember in his newsletter years ago, he wrote that, um, and you know, you can tell my academic background because I always mm -hmm. want to cite people where I, mm -hmm. where I know somebody else said it. I, I don't like to claim ideas that are not my own as my own. Mm -hmm. I want to give respect to other people. So he said that Ju Pluto in Capricorn is the dark side of more conservative policies and Pluto, not Pluto. Okay. I think I said that wrong. Pluto in Capricorn is the dark side of more conservative policies. Pluto mm -hmm. in Aquarius is the dark side of more progressive policies. Mm. And that was such an interesting way to put it. I mean, that mm -hmm. really changed the way that I started looking at so much of the Capricorn and Aquarius dichotomy. But yeah. I've always felt like the Aquarian vibration. Uh, years ago, I read an essay by Carl Jung called Eon, where he talks about the age of Aquarius. And he talks about this idea that we're expecting it to be this utopia, but the truth is Aquarius has a very strong duality to it. And you could think about this with the U.S., right? The U.S. has a moon in the sign of Aquarius. And I think that's why you do have a country that has this very strong duality that understands what uh, its Sagittarius ascendant means differently at various times. But ultimately, mm -hmm. it's always moving forward. But as right as the U.S. can go is as left as it'll go. And it seems like it's just going more and more in extremes, more and more each way. And so all of this is to say, that I understand Capricorn as I understand it in relation to Aquarius. And mm. so with Jupiter and Capricorn, especially with the connections to Pluto, it's especially interesting to me because either it is going to 
elevate and encourage societies and cultures and structures to bring healing into them, right? To bring a sense of legacy, a sense of vision. And I think we're likely going to see these examples of, you know, uh, CEOs who decided uh, to give everybody a living wage or who, you know, doubled everybody's wage and things like that. We're going to see these examples. There's Biggie again, having his water, right? Showing up in the video. Um, but I think that it can go the other way as well, yeah. where we see how power um, can be cruel. Yes. Really, it can be yeah. cruel when it wants to be and what that can mean. And it just, it, it makes me sad. Honestly, yeah. when I think about the dark side. And that's why I focus more on our own power. And I focus yeah. a lot more on let's be that force of healthy yeah. transformation, right? Let's figure out what it means to have structures and things like that in our lives and elevate the structures yeah. in our lives, right? Like, for example, with me, I have a, a few employees. Thank you, universe. Thank you to my audience. And I have some three employees now, and they all do different things. But I care a lot about paying people a minimum wage. Mm -hmm. You know, I care a lot about that. And I do, you know, I always, always do. And even when people have come and said, like, I will do this work for this amount, I'm like, you know, I don't think that that's fair. Mm -hmm. I want to elevate that. At the same time, though, um, I want a certain spirit, right? Of course, I want mm -hmm. people to come with a loving spirit <laughs> when they don't. Uh, that is sort of, you know, to me, okay, maybe this person is not the one to align with. And with Jupiter in Capricorn meeting Pluto, especially because I don't it's think the we meeting can understand, Pluto. Exactly. Yeah. We can't understand this cycle without that. I think that on the one hand, yes, there is that sense of elevation. But you know, there's also protection. <laughs> the last time I remember, it was 2008, Pluto went into Capricorn. And right away, all the economies fell, right, around the world. Mm -hmm. And I remember what happened then was Saturn was <clears throat> in um, Virgo, and it was Jupiter in Capricorn, and they trined. And right at the trine, all of these governments around the world announced these, um, what are they called, those... Um, measures like to protect and revive the oh right uh, like, like there's a name for it yeah I, i'm blanking on the word with you hold and on it's it's just escaped me what the word is but it was like this us no it wasn't austerity it's not a stimulus bill it's stimulus. not yeah. is that what it is like is it that. stimulus it's, it's like, like that it was like stimulus but also protection right yeah and i feel so, like stimulus is a canadian thing okay i, I think it might be anyways but we know I, what we mean I mean, I was in England, I was, I was at my graduation uh, for my MA at the time, and all the newspapers were about the stimulus package in England. Mm -hmm. And I know that right. in Canada, they had stimulus packages as well. Yes, yeah. And that is ultimately done to protect the way that things are, right? To protect mm -hmm. power as it is right now. Mm -hmm. And so I found that really um, intriguing and really interesting that that was taking place. Yeah. And so it could very well be some extent of a stimulus or a protection uh, that takes place to keep uh, certain structures, societal structures in place, right? Yeah. I, I think that's part of what we may see as well. But, you know, I also think, you know, I remember back when um, Uranus squared Pluto, we had all those squares with Uranus and Aries and Pluto and Capricorn. And I said, I think that what we're going to see is the end of gatekeepers. And we're going to mm. see a lot of like mini empires. And that's exactly what happened. YouTube is a huge example of that, mm. where all these people now, if you go on YouTube and you watch people with a YouTube channel, everybody's got their own thing going. They've got a mini empire going, right? In mm -hmm. their own way. And so, yeah, I think about Jupiter meeting Pluto in the context of that as well. So these are some of the, the thoughts I'm having, but yeah. I'm wondering why I am I have been resisting making that video. I think you're may right may I speak to it? May I yes, speak to it? Do. Okay. Do. Because if you're telling me the sun hits your sixth house, um, and then you get sick, you have like a lung thing. I'm like, oh mm -hmm. a so throat Jupiter thing. A throat, a throat thing. thing. Yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. what that tells me is that Jupiter in your sixth is you needing to care for your body 
And if you don't choose it, that means the expansion of a problem, right? So I'm not predicting like that means you will have a health problem. It's not that. It's more the expansion of a bad habit or of like, if you have an avoidant relationship to self-care of the body, then what's happening as you're Mm -hmm. looking at Jupiter and Cap, you're like, oh, avoidance, 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 Mm -hmm. because you have to get into your body. Mm -hmm. And that's what it wants you to do. And when it crosses your descendant, your avoidance will probably go away Mm -hmm. because your avoidance isn't about being with people, if I may be so bold (laughs) and knowing you. Um, It's about being in your body and doing the mundane BS that caring for a body requires. And I think that's probably, if you actually like maybe like look at your nutrition, look at your habits, look at your this, like spend a day doing that. I wonder if you could just make the video like that afterwards. You know what I mean? You are such a great astrologer. You're an amazing astrologer. Thank you so much. That is so great you. advice. I am literally, I, I'm already feeling more into great. it because yes. of this conversation that we're Good. having. And um, I'm lo- I'll let you know when that video Let me know. Done. Yeah. And do, I'll you try have, to do, it today. do you have Venus in the seventh or in the sixth? Six. And it's conjunct, uh, it's conjunct the moon, right? They're very close to each other. They're in different signs oh. just off, but they're, they're close enough to be a conjunction. So, oh, yeah. that's so interesting. Can I ask you a, a personal question about your health? Okay. Yeah, you don't have to answer, obviously. Okay. You can cut it out. Who cares? You know, you do your thing, girl. But how's your digestion? Mm. You know what? I have a cancer ascendant with Saturn in the first in mm. cancer. Mm-hmm. And, and I've moon had in the six. digestion. Yeah, exactly. Moon in the six. So I actually have had digestion issues my whole life. Yeah. And when I was a child, I had two surgeries on my stomach, actually. Oh. Yeah. Well, look, it is what it is, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. But, yeah. But it's it's very interesting that mm-hmm. it's in the chart on the one hand. Yes. But I think digestion is like a symbol of what you're assimilating and what you allow yep. in and about yep. nurturing yourself. How you process in yeah. a really personal way. And Venus being kind of like this bridge is, you know, v- the problem with that Venus, you know, any kind of Venus sun or Venus moon conjunction, IMO. And the reason why I say the problem with, because, you know, I look at those aspects and I'm like, that's a lucky damn aspect. That is, is what everybody wants. Well, it's but indulgent. Da- right? It's indulgent. Yeah, exactly. And people like you. When you have those aspects, people are inclined to be comfortable in your presence. The downside is that Venus functions so well. It's like, you're so good at coming across as healthy or coming across as fine and coming across as pleasant that it's easy to focus on the part of the bridge where you're not looking inside, you're looking outside at like how you relate to others and how others feel in your presence. And so I wonder if this Jupiter is really just trying to get you to like be present with your internal digestive process as a metaphor, maybe physically as well. But I, I'm a big believer with moon in the six, that you need physical space to gestate change and gestate ideas and gestate a uh, potential. And the problem with um, any kind of Sagittarius in the six, which you obviously have, is that it's like, okay, I'll gestate it when I'm done because I want to go. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I think that's fun. And also your body will eventually be like, yeah, 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 yeah but also, right? And so I think that it's like, it doesn't have to be, and this is important for you to hear, but also for anyone listening, it doesn't have to be like a three-week cleanse. It can simply be spending really intentional present time being like, hey, buddy, belly, what's up? Like, you're mine, I'm yours, let's be besties. Like, what do you Mm. need? I love you, what's up? Mm. And it's about really showering that same kindness that's so organic for you to shower on others to your meat suit, which is what I like to call my body. Um, Because I just feel like I'm such a 12th house person. I'm all like energy. I know I'm a triple Capricorn, but I'm like all in the 12th house. And so for me, I often feel like, well, this meat suit, is this really who I am? Because I don't feel like I'm this body. I feel like I'm something else. Um, And I, I think that a lot of 12th house people feel this way. But I do think that it's amazing you say that because my my book that just came out this week is all about this stuff, right? It's all about like one of the opening lines is you are your body, but you're also not your you're body. Not. Yeah. That yes. is spirit infused into yes. matter. And mm-hmm. it is by appreciating the whole that you're able to be that much more present and to live that much more fully. Agreed. So it's amazing. 
feel like you're telling me, you're reminding me of what is already within me, what I've been you already know. writing, what I've been teaching. Yep. So this is obviously a, a lesson this, for me. This and is, I appreciate it. It is so my pleasure. And I'll say this, Jupiter, different than Saturn. Jupiter is just like, you already learned this. Yeah. Saturn's like, learn it now. But yeah. Jupiter crossing your Venus, Jupiter transiting yeah. through your sixth, it's like, hey girl, you already learned this. When are you gonna when are you gonna actually own it? When are you gonna expand into the knowledge? Saturn's when when are you gonna embody the wisdom? But mm. Jupiter's like expand into it, right? Like take up space in it. So it's like taking up more space in your body. People write me questions for my podcast or they ask me in session. They learn a little bit about Jupiter and they're like, am I always going to gain weight or do I have to be big to be Jupiter? And I'm like, it is not about that. It's about the embodiment of energy. So mm. it's not about thin fat, whatever it is that your hang up is. It's about being present for the, your bigness. Because what I always say to people, which is really similar to what you just said, is that you, your soul is not inside of your body. Your body's inside of your soul. Mm. Your body is this little it's like a, it's like a, a branch off a tree. Sorry, I'm looking outside because there's a tree outside my window. Um, it's a branch on a tree of your soul. Your soul is massive. Your body's, you know, it's temporal. It won't last forever, but your soul does. And this actually, um, is something that I, I've really been kind of like noticing in my, in our talk together today is that at a certain point, because you and I have both been, you know, practicing astrologers, consulting astrologers for more than 20 years. And there's a certain thing that happens to pe practitioners, astrologers who've been reading for real people, not just studying, but like doing consultations for a long period of time. It's inevitable to become more spiritual. Mm. It's inevitable to see that the chart is as the chart does. And the chart gives us infinite tools. And at the end of the day, it's the soul. It is the soul. It's the embodiment. It's the self-acceptance and it's allowing that self-acceptance to radiate to what you do and who you touch and what you don't do and who you don't touch. And I think that spirituality is something that we were kind of talking about before was for some time, I think a little bereft in astrology circles. Um, because people were trying to be like respectable. Um, but I really feel like uh, it is really respectable to be whole and mm. you can't be whole without your soul. I know I made it rhyme. I didn't mean to, but you can't be whole you without your soul. Without your soul. You can't. I can't wait yeah. to read your book. Let's Oh, thank you. Yes. I'll make sure you get a copy. Don't you worry. And did a, did a write in return. And where are you right now? Oakland, California. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah awesome. Yeah, yeah. And okay. So speaking of your book, I've kept you for such a long time. So just With tell pleasure. me about your book. Like quickly tell me about what okay. you want. That's to it right behind me. I don't know if you yes. can see it on the screen. Yeah. It's my cute, pretty pink and gold magic. So, okay. So this astrology book uh, doesn't already exist. Um, and I say that because the structure of it's a little different. Um, the, sec the book is in three separate sections. And in each section, there's an introduction to the section. I'll tell you what they are in a sec. There's an introduction to the section, the, the topic of the section. And then I go through each of the planets and I really focus on planets, not signs. So it's not a sun sign book and uh, it's not an aspect book, but it's just about the planets. And I talk about in the first section, friendship and chosen family. Um, because, you know, we are family as astrologers and part of this really unique community. And then, you know, we have like our besties and our enemies and, you know, our work wife or whatever. So I have a whole section where we look at the sun, Mercury, Saturn, all the planets from the context of friendship and chosen family. And, you know, I focus on the planet and then I go through the planet and a sign and the planet and a house. The next section is, um, hooking up like the kind of dating where you're like, I'm never going to date this person seriously, but I'm going to date them for a few minutes. And also the first several months of dating where it's like TBD, you're like, is this going to be a thing? Is this not going to be a thing? Because so many astrology books about relationships are about like, you're already partner. Mm -hmm. And I think that's wrong thinking. When you first start dating someone, you're dating someone for three months. It doesn't matter what they're like as a husband or a wife. It matters what they're like when you're getting to know them. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. Because even when I do love like videos, I say, if you're open to meeting someone new, if you just started dating somebody, and if you're in a partnership, because it absolutely, those are very different places They're different. To be in. Yeah. They're different. Yeah. And this idea that Venus and Mars are the only two planets to look at, mm -hmm. or the sun is the only planet to look at is wrong. I mean, so many people date out of Saturn. 
fear, the desire for family, and a parent to their unborn child. Mm. So many people date out of Pluto, shame, uh, trauma. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> There's so many reasons why we and date. It's, it's the way it is. Yeah, it is. It's, yeah. We're humans. And, yeah. and anyways, and then the final section is long-term partnership relationships. And the whole book is inclusive. So, you know, I wrote this book, I, I have a very feminist lens. So it's not just thinking about um, things from a perspective of boy and girl. It's thinking about things um, from a kind of whole way that we embody ourselves over the course of our time. Mm. Like whether that's about, you know, the different stages of our gender experience, or it's about like, you know, I want a six-year-old to read it and a 16-year-old to read it and be able to be like, yes, I see myself here. And a 60-year-old to read it and see yes. themselves. Yeah. I love a crone. Give me an old one. I know, right? Day. I love, love it. a crone. I yes. love wisdom. What? Yes. You know, I'm very open to hanging out with anybody, whatever, but wisdom is awesome. Love wisdom it. is sexy. Yes. Wisdom is attractive. Yes. Wisdom is, is the thing. Yeah. yeah. I have a friend who's 12 years old. She's so wise. Yeah. And whenever we hang out, I'm just like, oh, how are you such a wise little old lady, old lady? Yeah. I just adore her. So, and in the book, we also like, it, you know, it's not the assumption that if you're partnered long-term, it's going to be monogamous mm. um, or that it's only two people. Um, I hold space I in the writing of the book of thank you for people who are ace, you know, who aren't sexual, but still want intimacies that are maybe romantic or maybe just platonic. I wanted to see a book that reflected me and reflected my friends and reflected my clients. And what I decided to do was create a tool that would give people who are both like seasoned astrologers, um, a kind of the benefit of my, you know, 20 plus years of counseling people. Um, and then new astrologers, the same benefit, because really I'm a big believer and this is where my Capricorn shows in the repetition of fundamentals. I am a big believer in just really focusing deeply on the fundamentals. And so that way you can apply them really organically and easily. So my kind of take and people who've like taken classes with me have often seen me do this, but it's like, I just picked up a lighter and it's like, you can look at Venus, any planet, whatever this way, but you can also look at it this way. And you can also look at it this way. And you can also look at it this way. And it's all Venus. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, so that's a big part of what is foundational to my work is looking at the same thing deeply and from many angles. And I think that that um, kind of application of astrology really is very humane. It works for humans. And mm. so my, I'm really enthusiastic about this book because it is, first of all, focused on planets, which are my crush. I have a humongous crush on planets. Mm. And then second of all, and, and also actually. houses. Yeah, yeah, love planets and houses. Signs are like the least interesting part of astrology to me. And um, some and astrologers a, flip that, like they find yes. signs more interesting. It's uh, that's the great thing. Yes, whatever you're into, you will find more of that when your practice, and it's ultimately Absolutely. about your practice. Yeah, there's so many ways to use astrology, and there's so many ways to be a person. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that that's really what it's about. And and the conversation we're having now is very Jupiter and Capricorn. Just fly, you know what I mean? It's like we're talking about something that is like an institution, astrology, and the use of it, and we're just kind of like breathing air into it which I love. Mm. So, so the book ultimately I'm very excited about because it's the book I'm that so when I was first learning, I would have wanted to have read this book. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about it. And if I may brag for a moment, yes, please. I'm do. obsessed with emojis. I love emojis. Yeah, yeah. And we worked with this great <gasps> artist named Joel Burden in the UK and he drew like custom cute emojis in the book. And it's like, the art is super cute and poppy. And like, you know, my vibe is I'm like very self-serious and I'm, you know, very studious, but also lots of color. I don't know what you can see here, but that's my neon sign of my logo. Yes. So, yeah. Yes. Like I'm, I'm a lot like of color. a rainbow cascading over you. And that makes perfect sense. Yes, it does. I want, I want a sign like that. You're honestly, yeah. I will have to send you the link to where to yeah, get it custom made. I, 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 I honestly, when I figured out that I could get multicolored neon, my whole life changed. Oh, it's just I like it. overnight. This is my Aquarius showing. It's just yeah. that I need lots of color all the time. So the book is very colorful and I'm so happy about that. So I have that happening. And then the other thing is, um, the, unexpected of love of my life. Exactly. Oh, okay. It's my, the unexpected love of my life is ghost of a podcast. Yes. I love having this podcast. I love giving You're people. So good things. at it. Thank You're you. So good Very at nice. It. I appreciate just, that. And I know how many people love your podcast so much. Thank and you. yeah, Thank good you. for I you. It. I can't tell you how much I love it. I never considered 
that the value I was giving an individual person would one day over the course of time kind of expand to be, I could do a reading for one person and thousands and thousands of people could yeah. get value from it. And I, you know, I've always made my clients record their session so that they could listen to it again. Um, but now that I have this podcast where people can listen to the last, you know, I'm at episode 76 this week. Um, they can listen to the last 76, um, whatever episodes. It's just, it's, it's such a gift to me because there's this way that I can be of service in ways that I don't need to be present physically for. And that is such a gift because it means I can do so much more work. And, you know, I'm a little workaholic over here. So I love that. And I love, you know, I have a very international base. I, I imagine you do too on YouTube. That's and the it's great a, thing. Like it's because it's all out there in the internet. Yeah. It's global, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 I love that. And I love um, being able to be connected in that way as an astrologer, as well as, as like a humanist um, and a person who's like, I am, you know, very socially and politically oriented and minded in my work. And, and I don't, and I've said this, to, I say this to anyone who will listen to me is I, I don't enjoy writing. Um, I'm a writer who doesn't enjoy writing. In fact, my book, I worked with a writer on and I spoke the book and, and she like tippy tapped and then we, and we edited it together. But, um, I love I, it. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Yes. You got to give me that person's contact too, because I, I have a lot of things that I would love to work out that way. That's amazing. It's, it's honestly, it was the only way I, I was getting called to write a book. Uh, literally I was getting calls from agents being like, I want you to write a book. And I also was just like, okay, I have to write a damn book. It's time. And I just don't enjoy writing. I do a lot of writing. I have, you know, I, currently I have three columns that I write. Um, but I just don't enjoy writing. I, it's time consuming. Uh, I, I'm a talker. I don't mean to surprise you when I say yeah. I'm a talker. <laughs> Obviously, so, yeah. yeah, exactly. So finding somebody who I could just speak the book, I could just pace and speak and just like shake the contents of my head into her computer, like, mm -hmm. or into her brain. So she could like type it out for me. It was such a great process for me. So I love um, it. Thank you. It, was the way to go for me. And I, um, that whole, that whole thing has, you know, it happened at the same time as the podcast. In fact, I was already writing the book when I decided to do the podcast very impulsively and it's just been nothing but, but good for me. So I've been really pleased about that. So if you are a person who likes to listen to podcasts, but you don't like to listen to podcasts, I upload them to YouTube every week so people can just like there's nothing really to look at but you can uh kind of like watch listen the podcast and it also is closed captioning so it's accessible you know because people have some hearing issues so yeah. that's that's my like uh affordable workaround I uh it. yeah i love I that love you it. think of everybody i love that you care and want to represent everybody i think it's thank wonderful you. i appreciate that I, it is important to me thank you so much jessica i loved getting to know more about you i loved hanging out with you i can't wait to see you because I think we both are speaking at Norwalk. At Norwalk, right? which and can I so, plug Norwalk to say? Please do. They're it amazing. Is, it's Laura the best. Nalbandian, we love her. She I always say her name amazing. wrong, but Laura Nalbandian and her whole family. I mean, you go yeah, to this this conference and it's a family run conference and it has is. been for generations. Yeah. And Laura has done this unique and really wonderful job of making it diverse, of, of going out of her way to create scholarships and invite in young people, people of color, queer people, and to make sure that their uh, needs and values are represented by having us as speakers, as well as, you know, just participants. And um, I just think she does a really great job of having really old astrologers and really young astrologers with different kind of standpoints and bringing us all together yeah. for this family run thing. And it's like, gives, gives me all kinds of good Capricorn energy. It's like, I love it. It is my favorite, uh, of all the conferences because of that. And uh, when you show up at the hotel, they give you a free cookie. So yeah, I love win, that. win, win. I, I love know. that hotel. And they give, and all the hotel rooms are suites. I really yes. love that too. I like to have like a separate bedroom. I mean, there's just so much that's so great about Norwalk. Mm -hmm. We love Norwalk. We love, love it. The energy and the connection and the intimacy and the space and uh, everybody 
is where they are. It doesn't matter what level you're at. And you find family. That's really yes. it. It's a yes. feeling of family. So I'm mm-hmm. looking forward to meeting you there. And I'm looking yes. forward to reading your book as well. I know. I can't wait until we can read each other's books and then uh, and then call each other on the phone and be like, and hey, like oh my God, you're so brilliant over here. And look <laughs> over here. You're so great. Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. Yay. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I'm so Thank honored you, to be Jessica. here. And I just... I just loved it. And I can't wait to see Jupiter and Capricorn show now. Yes, that'll be up in your honor. I will make oh, well, sure to do well. that. Yes. All right, my dear. Thank, Thank you. you so Lots much. Lots of love. Very big Thank hugs. You Thank you so much to everybody watching. And until we connect again, take care.